Welcome to Essential. Uh, wait, well, uh, wait. <laughs> welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. We're gonna actually put a little essential tennis into our tennis spin today. I got Ian and Joel in the house from Essential Tennis. Stay tuned. All right, guys, so I want to welcome Ian and Joel from Essential Tennis. We're actually going to be talking about the book called Essential Tennis. I don't know about you, but I don't even have time to read <laughs> the way I, you know, the way my life is in tennis. You know, like people ask me, don't you read? I'm like a people magazine. <laughs> you know, they got words. You guys have a channel, right, up for 14 years called Essential Tennis. Congratulations on 14 years. Thank you. Great, successful channel. Now, uh, what possessed you to want to write a book, <laughs> Ian? <laughs> it's a good question because I'm kind of like you. I don't, I don't feel like I have the time to sit down and read. But there is an audiobook version, though. If you, uh, if you listen in the car, just, just so you know. I do need a sedative to go to sleep that night. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, a couple reasons. First of all, even though maybe we're not fans of fine literature, uh, there are people out there that are still into you know tactile, uh, old school experience of consuming content that way. And uh, I'm a fan of, in general, providing resources that, that help as many people as possible. But the second part of it, I guess maybe for me the most important part of it was to have the opportunity to look across my 20 years of coaching and create something that kind of encompassed all the most important lessons and fundamentals and principles that I found have been key for players to reach the next level, tactics, strategy, technique, the mental game. And so a book is an opportunity I, I felt like to really encapsulate um, everything and put it into one resource. And that's where Joel was really you know, critical was in creating like a real actual book. I, I couldn't have possibly been able to do that. And, and so that's where he came into play. So it took you five years. Yeah. Like, was it kind of a start and stop kind of a thing? Sadly, no. Huh? <laughs> it was, uh, I mean, just to be clear, like I don't, uh, I don't work at Essential Tennis. I'm, I'm a tennis player, 4.0, 4.5 level, uh, mm -hmm. consume a lot of tennis content online, which is how I found Ian. So I reached out and pitched the idea of writing a book. And uh, that's the big difference. A YouTube video can be shot, you know, we'll do this in a half an hour. A, a book takes five years because you need to really lay out uh, the big picture. What chapters are we including? And then at the very end, it comes down to even word choice uh, because describing a physical act like playing tennis, you want to be very, very precise. Um, as I told Ian, you can always take down a video. You can change the wording in a blog if you make a mistake, but a book, that how it gets printed, that's the life of the book. We really want to make sure we get it right. That's why it takes five years. Wow. So basically continuous writing, like daily, weekly, monthly? Oh, writing, but it was conversations. I'd mm -hmm. consume some content, mm -hmm. write a draft, send it to Ian. He'd offer feedback. I'd write another draft, then we'd yeah. have a conversation. I mean, it's a, a true collaboration. And this is only the second time we've met. I live in Israel. He lives in Milwaukee. Oh. So uh, we weren't in the same room. This is a a true 21st century project. So wait, wait, wait. You're the ghostwriter. No, if I were a ghostwriter, my name wouldn't be on the cover. Be invisible. Oh, okay. And I wouldn't be sitting here with you. <laughs> so Ian, was there a particular topic that uh, was the most <clears throat> difficult for you? Yeah, I think the easiest topics were, I have an audio podcast, and generally I save topics like mental toughness and being an effective competitor tactics and strategy, talking about you know, um, deconstructing your opponent, you know, figuring out how to put together a good game plan. All those types of topics work really well for audio. What um, worked great for video was like more analytical, technical, so, you know, like stroke breakdowns uh, and, and working with students and, and pop, you know, that obviously worked very well for, for video, but it's hard to translate that into um, written form. And again, that's where Joel was like super critical because, and I learned I learned a lot, frankly, throughout the process of like going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. When like we have a chapter on the kinetic chain and how to use the body efficiently and fluidly, and so so that you can hit a strong, powerful shot without muscling it and, and hitting hard 
or at least with a lot of effort. And so the a huge value for me in working with Joel was um, in that collaborative process, he wouldn't let me get away with just saying like some coachy, like surface level description. He'd be like, okay, no, but what, what does that like really mean? And so throughout the process of going back and forth, um, he brought a lot more out of me than what I was used to having to explain. And it was those descriptions uh, formed by him in like actual written, like literary, you know, form that I think has made the the book really, really powerful for, for tennis players. That's a great point because I feel like you can, on a video, you can show, right? right? But how do you show in written form? Believe it or not, some people would rather not have to learn it by watching, but learn it by reading it, thinking about it, trying it themselves. So uh, it's not like this is a second best option. For some people, they prefer it. And re what it really comes up with is finding the way, the right way to describe it. Do we, and I think what we ultimately came up with is we gave some real life examples of where the kinetic chain would be something you would use naturally. If you were to push a heavy sofa across the room, you would not stand next to it and use your arm. You would bend down naturally and push with your entire body. Mm -hmm. At least so people could understand, oh, I do get more power by bending and pushing as opposed to just using, you know, straining with my arm. Once that clicks that there's value, when we can describe that, then the rest of it makes makes sense. Yep, yep. No, you you guys, you did a great job. No, thanks, Eric. Putting it together. I can actually visualize when I read your book, like doing it the right way. To your <laughs> point, I think that's where a real writer, like for me, was so valuable because... I could have technically written a book, but it wouldn't have been nearly as impactful or, or valuable without Joel's input. What was your favorite part of it? What was your favorite chapter? For me personally, my, my favorite part of it, I don't know if you've made it, how far you've made it through, but the conclusion uh, for me personally was very personal and um, a hard story, uh, honestly, for me to, uh, to talk about. Uh, I went through a period of my own tennis that was really um, dark and kind of, um, unhappy and in a nutshell throughout my career what I really strive for is to arm tennis players with what they need to be able to guide their own journey and their own path in a healthy happy like fulfilled way and to the extent that there's misconceptions about any given part of the game is where players start to get start to get frustrated and stuck and start blaming themselves. And at least if you're like kind of a perfectionist, you know, like me, and you wonder like, why, you know, why am I so bad? You know, basically when there's not a deep understanding of what the game really is and like what we're actually like trying to do out there. So the conclusion was basically for me, looking back over like my own career and then looking back over the content of the book and kind of tying it together and, and wishing, you know, the reader well, that they can hopefully with this, um, knowledge and insight be able to navigate the game in a in a happy you know fulfilled way if i can jump in too my favorite part of the book was what ian just mentioned all the misconceptions the book is full of misconceptions that we break uh, because we felt it was so important for tennis players to have and coaches to have a true understanding of what tennis is how many points you're going to lose even on your best day what what uh improvement actually takes and uh and what it actually looks like to improve. And there are so many misconceptions that I had before I began writing the book with Ian that I now understand. It makes me feel better as a tennis player and I can forgive myself a little more for the many, many mistakes I make because I know they're actually supposed to happen. Let's give the fans an example. Like how many mistakes did does Nadal make on a normal basis in his career? Yeah, I'll, I'll go even a little bit more broad. Wait, we, do you know the answer to this? I do. Oh, you That's do because you read it. Okay. <laughs> he's, he's, he's putting it up on the team. Yeah, yeah. Uh, across the board, and we cite Craig O'Shaughnessy, a uh, statistician and an incredibly insightful writer, uh, analyst, a tennis analyst, uh, a lot in the book because I, I think he draws out so many core truths about tennis. At any given point, on either the ATP or WTA tour, the world number one is winning about 55 or 56 percent of their total points uh, across the board. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more than half. And if you're winning 51 or 52 percent, I've done this math a couple times with a couple different players. I think it was Isner that I looked at once, and he was right smack dab at 50-50 on a year that he finished like 19th in the world. 
and made however, you know, whatever, a couple million dollars. So I think understanding that, that kind of subtext that, wow, to be a world-class player or just to be successful, whatever level you are, you know, 3 5 5 you know, whatever. If you can win just a little more than half, you're going to win most of your matches. And if you can, if you can win 4% more than, you know, half the points, you're going to probably roll over just about everybody easy. So Nadal at the French, arguably the most dominant athletic performer, you know, in a particular venue of like all time across all sports, uh, wins 56% of his points. And so just having that context, I think is key. You're supposed to lose 40 plus percent of your points, even in a match that you dominate. You use the term, you just prime example, you use the term expect to lose points <laughs> as opposed to accept. I think a lot of players get down on themselves mm -hmm. after every point they lose. Oh, I and you can hear it. If you go to play the courts and <laughs> just turn on your phone and record everything you hear is... <laughs> swears and curses of oneself but people bouncing. yeah people expect to win every point or close to 90 percent and if they don't they really uh, believe they have messed up they yeah. gave their opponent an in and what we're saying is mm -hmm. hey really pay attention to that 60 55 percent that you can win and should win and when it doesn't happen give yourself a break because you're going to take yourself out of the match if you focus on those losing points seems like we all start uh, learning to do something correctly when we're, let's say, taking a lesson or practicing. But, but when it's game time, it's almost like our mindset changes and we're basically playing not to lose mm -hmm. and playing a totally different game that we kind of don't recognize. It's so true. Right? Yeah, 100%. I, yeah, I, every tennis player has definitely experienced that. And I, I think it's key for players, I think, to approach the mental game like they do their technical game. Mm -hmm. like, I don't think anybody assumes that you can go out, make one correct like shadow swing, and be like, all right, that's it. Like, I got it. Or I like to uh, compare it maybe to fitness. Like, you, you can't work out once and be like, all right, I'm good for the – like. The rest of the year, like I'm all set. Like I, I did my fitness and I'm I'm good to go. The mental game to me is very similar in that. Uh, Joel, and Joel and I've been talking about this a lot over the last week. The tour that we've been doing, he's been, because of my shoulder tear. He's been in the hot seat. He's played a bunch of matches over the last week on camera, which he's never done before. And is it fair to say you entered the trip kind of terrified of like what was going to happen? Yeah. And throughout the week, as he continually was put in that position, and then realized that. The boogeyman wasn't on the other side of that door and like everything's okay and it was just a learning opportunity and a mm -hmm. learning experience throughout the week he has completely you know, like 180 changed his perspective on being put in that high pressure situation and so mental muscle is a is a phrase i like like you have to develop it you, and to do that you have to put yourself underneath like the bar and actually do the repetitions but i think a lot of players as soon as they feel that inner like anxiety or stress or pressure they instantly judge themselves as like not being a good competitor or something's wrong or I need to trick myself and like pretend like this isn't actually a real match or I need to trick myself into thinking the score is something different or something along those lines. But the reality is that we should not only be feeling that, but we should welcome it because it means like we care about it. It's important to us. We've worked hard on this. And so, of course, there's going to be a little bit of tension and, and friction uh, as we go into a high pressure situation. So I would, I would encourage everybody to just almost embrace that uh, experience and, and build your mus mental muscle. And that's how people become great competitors, not by like avoiding it or trying to figure out how not to be nervous. Okay, so there are actually a lot of books on the market. You know, Brad, Gilbert, Brad Gilbert's Winning Ugly, of course, The Mental Game of Tennis. Um, what's the difference in those books versus yours? Yeah, there are a lot of books. If you just go to Amazon and type in tennis and coaching or like tennis instruction, um, lots to choose from. I think what makes essential tennis different is all the ones you'll generally see listed are, are specialized. They focus on maybe double strategy or uh, winning ugly is very tactical, you know, focused, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, very practical. Uh, the inner game is obviously very mental. And what we were shooting for with essential tennis was to have a resource that was very holistic in nature and covered all the, the big 
uh, check boxes. Like the, you just can't go without. And so there's a section on the improvement process itself. Like how do you learn how to learn effectively so you can guide yourself through your own you know, improvement journey. Uh, tactics and strategy is in there. Technique and how to swing the racket is in there. The mental game is in there. And so across the, all the, you know, the several decades that I've been coaching, we're trying to pick out uh, the key fundamental principles that are most important in all of those different aspects and put it into one resource. In one of your chapters, you say something about how if a person has only $20 to spend <laughs> to improve their tennis, that they should return, return this book, send it back to Amazon, they'll take it back, all right, <laughs> and buy a tripod. What's that all about? Yeah, and, I, and for, for what it's worth, like I actually believe that because as much as I believe in the book, all the theory is great and all, but without putting it into practice, which I, I think video is, is uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit more. To the extent that people have any kind of disconnect between what they think they're doing and what they actually are doing, uh, that like black box of information is gonna be most responsible for holding people back or having themselves like plateau. If you just go through 10 or 20 years of tennis, assuming, let's say that you split step, which the vast majority of tennis players assume they do, but almost nobody does, then that like bottom of the pyramid fundamental, you know, thing is gonna keep so many other dominoes from falling down as they work hard and push hard to improve the rest of their footwork and their, their balance and their positioning and all those other sorts of things all suffer as long as they don't actually understand or realize that they're not doing that critical first step that's like so important. So I believe very, very deeply that video is the most powerful uh, revelatory like training aid there is because it instantly unlocks all those different things that are unknown, the things that you, you don't know what you don't know. And even though it's intimidating and might be painful at first, like I'm sure your first couple videos is Maybe hard for you to watch yourself, but in time, like you got a lot better, didn't you? By by watching yourself. I don't watch myself <laughs> ever. Like you don't, don't watch your own videos. Not really. I don't like watching myself. It's not something I like to do. I would bet you that if you did, you would steadily improve. You're totally right. I saw a video of myself interviewing somebody, and I'm like, yeah, I need to speed up. And you never would have known that yeah. if you hadn't watched the video. That's so even correct. if it stung a little, you learned, and that's. Mm -hmm. With tennis, all, all the more so. Yeah, I think self-awareness is key. And not uh, not just tennis, but obviously everything. You know, sales or uh, public speaking or making videos or whatever. And so uh, I'm passionate about revealing those kind of secrets that players have about themselves. Because I think that's just the biggest ROI. Like that's the biggest return on whatever time you put in on the court. If, you, if you're focusing on something that's like 10 steps further down the road, but you, you missed the first most important thing, then you're just not gonna be as successful on the court. All right, guys, so I don't want you to listen to Joel and return the book. <laughs> I want you, though, to buy the book, buy the book, and get a tripod, okay? Read the book first, spend the extra 20 bucks, and get another tripod. 40 bucks, right? Or less than half the price of a tennis lesson. Totally. All yeah. right? It's true. So, Joel, where can we get this book? This well, it comes out on May 31st. That's the official release date. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any, anywhere books are sold, you can pick it up. It's also on Audible. It's on the Kindle uh, store and like Apple and Google, like e-reader. Like however you like to consume uh, books, you can, you can find it. It's called Essential Tennis, and it's by my buddies, my mans, Ian and Joel. So I want to thank Ian. It's been thank a pleasure. You. Thank Likewise. you for uh, traveling out here. It's very generous for you to have us and, uh, and spend yeah, time. Thanks so much here. Yeah. It's a great shop, too. We oh, love just hanging yeah, out and browsing. Yeah. And oh, thank you. Everybody should stop They're going to buy a bunch of stuff before yeah, we, they leave. <laughs> I'm buying a $90 spoon. I, and if that sounds crazy, we can email us. We'll explain what that means. The store has everything. He's going to make a big pot of soup. <laughs> right. Pleasure, Joel. Thanks so much, Eric. Thank you for uh, Thank you both for writing the book. Uh, of course. Pleasure thank reading you. it. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis.